Title page there, Migration and Winter Ecology of the Eastern Whippoorwill. Yep, looks good. Perfect. Um, let me know if I'm cutting in and out or your internet's usually pretty good for me here, but let me know if that starts to break up or or uh, if my sound is, is starts to starts to get funky. Um, but this is a project we've been doing for a couple of years. It's a project I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be doing with my wife, uh, Maria Bachermans, who's pictured here in the bottom right, not with a whippoorwill, um, at a whippoorwill site, but with a kestrel. Um, and she's at the Worcester, Poly Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Worcester. And we've been able to get some, some students from the school to help us out on the project as well. So that's been, it's been great. And we, we have a history of working together on various projects. And this is kind of the first big project we, we started working together on in Massachusetts. Um, we did some smaller stuff with this one. This one started small and then kept getting bigger and bigger. Um, and it's ongoing. So. Uh, what I'll be talking about today ha has kind of concluded, but we'll be, uh, at the end, I'll briefly mention kind of the direction we're going with the species and, and the newer questions that, that we want to ask. But this is going to focus on migration in winter rather than nesting season stuff here today. All right, I know, well, pretty sure you all are, are, are familiar with the Eastern Whipperwell. You've got some good spots out there on the vineyard. Um, with the with the state forest, um, I haven't been out there for any whippoorwill counts. I seldom get out to the vineyard, unfortunately. Um, but but I but it, it's one of our strongholds. Looking at the data uh, for the for one of the strongholds for whippoorwills in the state is the state forest out there, Manuel Corellis. Um, so it's you guys have them just just like uh, you you have some of the higher densities of them in, in the state out there. But they're not doing well overall. It's a species that uh, you probably know was split. It used to just be called the whippoorwill. Now it's the eastern whippoorwill. So the American Ornithologists um, Union split it uh, or into two, two species. So the western one is now, or the southern and western one is the Mexican whippoorwill. And the one here we have in the east is the eastern whippoorwill. But there used to be the same species in, I think it was 2011. Um, that it that it got split. Uh, they're not they're not really doing very well. The eastern whippoorwill over the last. I mean, you hear lots of stories. You know, people who used to hear these things in their backyard decades ago, and that no longer happens. That's kind of the the typical story you hear about whippoorwills. Um, I know there there was a big tornado in South Central Massachusetts in. Uh, that was about 10 years ago too, in, in 20, I think it was 2011, the big one that went from Springfield over to uh, just just uh, south of Worcester. And and we did some surveys out there. And, and as part of those, we, we often run into uh, a lot of the, the tornado area was on private land. And so we run into the, some of the private landowners and we get to talking and they're asking what we're doing. And, and, and they are eager to report that they now hear whippoorwills. Um, behind their house, you know, in that, that forest regrowth caused by the tornado damage. So um, some areas they're doing well, but, but largely because of, of uh, forest maturation. Uh, that's one of the reasons anyways that, that this species has, has declined. The habitat just isn't quite right for them. They're, they're somewhat of a, of a specialist. When you look at the population trends so here, can you guys see my cursor? When I, if I'm circling that, yeah, you can. Okay, yeah. good. So here is the uh, breeding bird survey data. This is just for Massachusetts, so somewhat of a limited uh, data set there and not a great species for that kind of a survey. But nonetheless, um, you see a, a pretty consistent and strong decline from, I know you can't read the, the smaller numbers here, but this is from 1966 on the left side of the, uh, of the graph to um, 2017 on the right side. And you see that strong decline Decline starting to uh, slow down, but it, the, the decline continues up to the current day um, throughout the state. So a 6.6 .6 annual decline um, since that time. So that's a really strong, I mean, that's that's such a large percentage of the, of the population. I can't remember what that would equate to, um, but it's gotta be about 80% of the population that we've lost since, since 1966. Um, anything over like a one and a half percent decline starts adding up in fast when you're looking at 10 or 20, 30 years. 
And I guess you can see their, their breeding range is in the orange. So they do get, you know, they're pretty broad breeding range, but they certainly, you know, as I said, they're, they're more of a habitat specialist. So they're really patchily distributed across that range. They're not, you know, there, there are lots of places within that, within that range that they just aren't present. Um, with, with a lot of the sandy soils in, in Massachusetts, we have some, some areas that are, are particularly, have, have particularly high densities of this species. They, they, that's one of their, seems to be one of their preferred habitats. But you can get them in, in, in um, as I said, with the tornado damage, um, with, with forestry practices, uh, you know, forest harvesting or, or natural disturbance. Um, and non non sandy soil areas as well, but the highest densities do seem to be um, the, the kind of the pitch pine, scrub oak, um, pine barren areas. And as I said, they got listed as a species of uh, special concern under the Massachusetts Endangered Species Act. So if we go and we look at uh, you know, the Massachusetts data in the in the breeding bird atlases that Mass Audubon has run, you know the first atlas and the second atlas. I'm sure you've seen some of these maps before, but uh, for, if, if we focus in on Whippoorwill, this is the first atlas here. You know, the dark green is confirmed breeding. So with something like Whippoorwill, it's, you know, it's pretty hard to con confirm their breeding. So it's no surprise that that's a, a very small number of blocks. Uh, the the, the x-axis is the number of blocks within the state. Um, so the, the green is probably much more, you know, closer to reality or the lighter green than the dark green, where this is, this is the probable. And the larger bar here is the, the possible number of, of blocks occupied. But essentially, what, what I want you to see is that it, it's decreased dramatically between the first block or first atlas and, and the second atlas. Um, whether you're looking at confirmed probable blocks or possible blocks, um, you know, the, the, it's, it looks like it's about, you know, you've lost about 50% almost of, of the blocks. And of course, with that data, it's not, you know, it's a little bit coarser. It's not abundance data. It's more presence absence data. So that's even more alarming. Uh, you know, I think that's even more alarming because that means that these blocks, if they're not present, they not only, you know, declined, but they're not actually being observed. And they, you know, they weren't heard. Um, so so they, were, they were likely absent from them. So that's even, you know, if there was a, you know, if they had declined and they were still observed, they'd be, they'd be documented here. Um, so an actual absence is it's a, it's a strong flag that the species really isn't doing well in certain areas in the state. So when you look at the blocks occupied, the top map here is, is the Atlas 1, and, and the bottom map is Atlas 2. Um, it doesn't look as bad. Well, in some ways, it doesn't look as bad as over here. There are still areas that, that, are, that are strong signals for Weber Well. You can see the um, Miles Standish State Forest area here it is still strong. Um, we've got some areas on the vineyard out here that are still strong, but, but overall it's decreased dramatically, particularly central mass um, that's on the second atlas is pretty sparse and the Berkshires also is, there, there's hardly any there in the Berkshires. Um, whereas, whereas if you compare it to that atlas, you know, decades before, um, much more, uh, many more blocks throughout, throughout the state. So that gives you an idea of, Give you an idea of where, uh, you know, how, how the population is doing in the state and, and where it's being most impacted. So, so for our study, you know, we were interested in, you know, the, the declines of Weber wells and really looking at the full annual cycle. That's kind of becoming more and more clear with, with the number of species that are being studied is that to get a really good idea of what's going on, you really do need for these migratory species you can't just look at the breeding grounds or, or you can't just look at the wintering grounds. Um, you have to look at the full picture, the, the breeding grounds, the wintering grounds, and the points in between, the, migra the spring and fall migrations. And, and only when you have all of that data can you really start to evaluate where the limitations may be occurring for, for a species that's, that's decline, declining. And we had some, we don't have a lot, but we have some information on the breeding grounds. Um, we do surveys and there's a whole network in, in, in a number of the states that, that do um, kind of like a BBS route, but, but for Weber wells um, or, or nocturnal for night jars in general, but primarily for Weber wells, um, where, where it's a, a road-based route that, that, uh, that people use vehicles to, to 
to cover and then do points every every mile or two um, point count points you know listening points um, and so we had that and, and we had some other survey efforts on, on state lands as well and we got to thinking gosh there's like nothing known you know being a nocturnal or cre crepuscular and nocturnal species um, and migratory there was hardly anything known on the wintering grounds. And so that's where we decided to, to start. You know, if we could get some information on the wintering grounds and migration, um, we can add that with what we already know on the breeding grounds. And that'll really help us build this full life cycle um, picture for, for the species. So, so in this study, um, we, were, we were really focusing on, on migration and wintering grounds, getting locations for their wintering grounds understanding the timing of, of migration, when they're departing, when they were you know, departing in the fall, when they were arriving in the spring, um, and, and to start looking at the habitat that, that, they're, that they're using in, in other places. So for this study, um, we, had, we had three sites uh, across the state. We tried to spread them out um, as, far, as, as much as we could, west to east. I live in central Mass, so it was kind of easiest to, to go both ways, go, go to the east and to the west. Um, but one of our sites is, is uh, Montague Plains Wildlife Management Area, and, and that's Montague Mass here. And the uh, our middle site is the Bolton Flats Wildlife Management Areas uh, here in Bolton. And these, so these are both mass wildlife owned properties and uh, heavily managed for, for wildlife. And then our third site was uh, Joint Base Cape Cod down here in uh, on the Cape. Also uh, a managed a managed site and uh, uh, vast amounts of of uh, pine pitch pine scrub oak habitat. And we knew there were sizable populations of, of whipper ahead of this study. We already knew from survey efforts that that the densities of whipper wells were, were high at, at all of those sites. All of these sites are managed at some level with fire, um, which I think probably uh, strongly benefits the Wiper wells. Um, so these are all, they're all larger sites in terms of the habitat that, that they provide for Wiper wells, that, uh, that pine barren type habitat managed with fire and, and some timber harvest as well. Whoops, went the wrong way. So we wanted to um, put tracking tags on birds to learn about where, where they were going once once they left Massachusetts. And to do this, we, we, we never actually, we passively caught a few whipper wells, I guess, uh, as part of other projects, um, but we never actually tried to, to lure a whipper well in. You know, it works really well with songbirds. Um, and we just kind of hoped that it worked with whipper wells as well. But it was, it, was, uh, it was more of a trial and error method um, at first anyways. But, but we went with it. We, we set up uh, an array of mist nets. We started out setting up um, like three or four mist nets at a, at a, all kind of connected together and then put uh, a speaker broadcasting unit where we play the, 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 the vocalization of the whippoorwill in, in the middle um, to, to lure in a, a male or a whippoorwill. We assumed that the male would be easier to lower in um, at the net. So we went with that. And almost immediately we, we you know, we found that that, that was going to be effective. Like the birds were, were responding um, pretty well. And they didn't always fly into the net, but they 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 almost always, if there was a bird in, in the area, it came over and, and checked out that playback unit. Um, so we used that traditional mist net. You can see a net here if you're not familiar with the mist net, but in the bottom right photograph, this is a, a student at WPI and, and myself setting up one of the nets, it's kind of opening it up here. Um, but we use, if you've ever been to a, a solid owl camping station before, we use the same mesh size net that is used with solid owls. These are 12 meter nets in length and uh, put them up with some uh, conduit uh, poles in the, in the soil. And here's a, a photo of uh, Maria, my wife and I, with a bird in the hand. You can't really tell there's a bird there, but, but we're putting on a tag. And, and this is our kiddo, um, Bowden, holding a, holding a whippoorwill there. 
Um, we used to play back to trap birds and they come into the net. Um, once, once they were captured, we collected a lot of the morphological measurements. Um, we were able to tell if it were male and female based on its plumage. So the males had the you know, extensive white in the tail um, that, that, that they'll flash and the females have much more, uh, they don't really have a bright white, but, but more of a dusky uh, coloring in the, in the, in the tail. Um, you can tell age up to a point. So we could age them as, as either a second year bird. So a bird that was hatched out the prior year, they still have some of their juvenile feathers. So if you can, you can see that they actually, it, you can see it on their primary coverts. They'll have buffy edging on the tips of their primary coverts. Um, so if you see that, you can call it a second year bird. And if they, that the older birds don't bring in the, the buffy tipped feathers, uh, when they molt. So if they didn't have those buffy tipped feathers, I don't have a good picture of that. It's something it's hard to take a photo of, especially at night, um, but it, uh, you could age it as an after second year bird. And you can't really go beyond that. So we were limited, we, we could get some age information, but it was limited to either it was, you know, hatched out the prior year or any year before that. Um, so we couldn't really, we couldn't call them you know, a third year bird or a fourth year bird or a fifth year bird. Um, we didn't know that level of detail, just it was older than a, than a two-year-old bird. Um, and we started putting on, uh, so each bird that, that we, that we caught got a GPS tag. And these are, these are small tags. I have, maybe it's the next slide. I have uh, in the image of it. There, there it is. So they're, they're really small tags. They're not, um, you know, when, when most people think of GPS tags, they think of a kind of a large unit with a big antenna on it. And this looks more like a traditional uh, radio telemetry tag. Um, has a smaller antenna. The tag itself is about a gram in, in, in weight. Uh, so, so it's small, but it doesn't do, you know, you're limited in what you can do with it. Um, it's a data logger, and that means it, it uh, when it's connecting, it does connect to satellites and gets a GPS fix, um, but it doesn't transmit that data. So you, you've probably seen people, you know, presentations from people who study uh, raptors or, or, or geese or some of the larger birds, and they have these big satellite tracking tags on their backs, and and those just kind of upload data um, to their computer. Uh, that these aren't quite like that. Uh, these are tiny, they're, they're a gram, a whippoorwill is only about 50 grams, so, so the tag weighs 2% uh, of the bird, and, and, and you need a tag to weigh 3%, you know, it can't be above 3%, or you're not going to get permits to put it on it, um, and in general anyways. Um, so, so we needed this, this really small tag, and they were only recently available in this size. They, they, you know, tags keep getting smaller and smaller, uh, and it's only in, in the last few years that, that these types of GPS tags are as small as they are. Um, but they, they have a, a very small battery in them. There's no, you know, with a whippoorwill, solar panel is not going to really help you. Plus, it's a really small tag, so it would be a very small, small solar panel. So it's got a battery in there, uh, but a battery that, that doesn't have a, a huge duration in, in terms of lifespan. So we were told that, that at most we'd get about 62 times you could turn it on and off. So most of the time that the tag's just sitting on the bird and it's off. And we had, uh, so that the user programs the tag, you hook it up to your computer and you program it when you want it to turn on and when you want it to turn off. So we programmed it um, uh, so for, to, to turn on and off at, at different times or at, at, it would come on for 10 minutes and then it would turn itself off. Um, Yeah, I can't remember if I, if I, I, mean, I just talk about it now because I can't remember if it's in a slide later or not. But so, so we programmed it differently through the year um, during migration or what we thought of as migration. So September and October in, in the fall, we programmed them to turn on every three days, for just one time every three days. So we wanted these to last, you know, for, for almost a year in, in length, if, if we could. We wanted to get that full time frame of, of when they left in the fall to when they returned in, in the spring. But we wanted the, as much data in between it as we could also. So it was kind of a, a balance, but we had them turn on and off once every three days during what we thought was migration. And then when we thought it was winter, so middle of November 
into March, they were only turning on once a week. Um, and then once we got back into spring migration, they were programmed to come back on every three days. So that's how we kind of uh, planned it out to, to collect data on both migration and, and on the wintering grounds. Oh yeah, and these tags, that, so it's the harness there in the bottom right. It's just some, uh, this is like jewelry cord. It's called magic stretch. And it turned out to be a really good material. A lot of people, a lot of biologists, ornithologists use this type of material for these basic tags. And it's just called a leg loop harness. So it's pretty simple. It doesn't get glued to the bird at all. Um, and this loop on one side goes up one leg and kind of fits into the notch in its hip. And then the, the backpack here fits right on its lower back. You can see the antenna on this bird just a little bit there. Um, where the, where the cursor is. It's a short antenna, but the, 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 the tag is like right there. So it goes up one leg, the uh, uh, GPS is on the back, and then the other loop goes up the other leg and fits into the hip knot as well. So it's, it's pretty tight when it's on the bird, but this has some give, um, so it stretches with the bird and if they gain fat during migration, it, it allows for, for um, a little stretch as the bird gets a little bit bigger as well. So pretty basic, but, but it works really well. We never, as far as we know, we never had any fall off. Um, every bird that, that we ended up recapturing, uh, that we put a tag on, still had its tag on. Well, that was, so that was super uh, encouraging. All right, so getting to some of the results. Um, so we did uh, tagging in, in 20, a few years ago. So in 2018 and 2019, um, but as I said, you know, the, these data, it's a, it's a, the, the GPS tags, they're data loggers. So you have to recapture the bird the next year and remove the tag and download the data. The only way to get data was to, to recapture that bird and remove the tag. So that first year, it's, man, we're, it, was, it, it was, it was, we were nervous that first winter. I mean, we had a bunch of birds with tags. We didn't know if they'd come back. We didn't know if we'd be able to capture them again. Um, and who knows how effective the tag would be even if we could get it back. So there was a lot of, a lot of questions during that, that first off season or the first winter period. Um, but in 2018, so the first year we were doing this, we had 27 birds and, and the males were easier to capture, but we were catching some females as well. Uh, so we were just putting them on all males that we got and, and all the females that we got. Um, so the 27 that first year, 21 were males and, and six were females. In the next year, it became quickly apparent that the females are, are much harder to, to, to get back any tags. We didn't get any uh, of the female tags back that first year. And, and so we stopped wasting our money, essentially. It would be great to get some data on, on the females, but uh, we just decided to focus on males. Um, because we, we weren't getting any data back uh, on the tags we put out that were just being lost. The second year, we deployed 31 tags, and 30 of those were, were on males. Um, if you look at our, our recapture rate, it was pretty good. I don't know. I can't remember now what we expected. I think, if, I think we were thinking if we could get a third of these tags back, you know, that'd be pretty good. We'd be, we'd be happy with that. Um, not knowing the survivorship of the birds and, and how how fun, how how uh, strong their site fidelity was, you know, returning to the exact same territory year after year, um, but we got a, a lot better than that. So in 2019, uh, catching that that first cohort, we caught 57 percent of the birds uh, that we deployed tags on, and when we broke it down by by age category, it was pretty pretty surprising. Um, we were pretty astounded. We got 90% of our, of our older birds, our after second year birds, um, nine out of 10, we were able to recapture those. And we're just putting the nets in pretty much the exact same locations that we put them in the prior year, in the same territories. And, and all of those birds came back to their exact same territories. We didn't catch them one territory over. We caught them in the same net that we caught them in the year before. So they were, that was pretty cool to see um, that they were coming back to those exact same territories. Um, the, res the results for our younger birds was substantially different, however. We, we did get some of them, but as you can see, it was more like 30% or, or three out of 11 of, of the second year birds, males that we captured. Uh, we, three of the 11 were recaptured. 
um, so less than 30 percent. Uh, so so a big difference there. Small sample size that first year, but but the same pattern repeated the next year. So in 2020, overall, you know, overall the results are pretty similar. 63 percent uh, recaptured of all the birds. 14 of 18 of the after second year birds again uh, were, were caught again. So again, very high rates. A little bit lower than the prior year. Um, but, but, but comparable and almost exactly the same pattern for the second years where only four out of 11 uh, of those males were recaptured. And we did finally recapture a female in, uh, in 2020. So we were super excited. Um, we recaught one female that we tagged two years earlier. And every time we caught a bird, uh, once we got home, uh, even though it was like midnight by the time you got home, um, we had to try to attach it to the computer, you know, it's a USB kind of connecting cable with two little clamps that you hook onto the, onto the uh, GPS tag, and then you plug the USB port in and it tries to download what it has. Um, so we would do that every time we caught a bird, just to see where, where it had gone. It, we were so curious to see, because they were turning up, uh, I'll show you in, in a few slides, but they were turning up in, in, in pretty different places. Um, and so we went back and we, we hooked up this female and we we're super excited to see where she went because in some species, the females go to a, a completely different wintering area than the males, that they show different patterns um, and it wouldn't download. And we tried to charge it and we tried to charge it overnight and over days and the battery was just completely dead and it wouldn't download. And we thought, okay, we'll send it back to the company and they'll be able to get it off, right? They'll get the data off. So they said, yep, send it to us and, and we'll look at it. And we, we sent it back to Low Tech, the company that, that makes the tags, and they couldn't get anything either. So unfortunately, we have zero data on, on females. And I don't think anybody does uh, on one turn around a female. So that's that's something that, that would be good to try to get in the uh, coming years. But we weren't able to do it. Um, so for the migration, I'm going to start uh, talking about the migration points, and then I'll come. I'll talk about the wintering ground locations. Uh, but in total, we were able to, to get 533 uh, points collected by the GPS units. We had to drop a bunch of these. If you if, if you're familiar with GPS data, some you know they're they're communicating with the, the satellites. But if they only get two satellites, or you know maybe three. The data isn't as accurate as you want it to be. Um, if you have more than three satellites, you're, you're pretty good. Um, but but because the, the accuracy was limited in a bunch of them, uh, we had to drop 53 points, um, but we were able to retain most of them still. So 480 points we were able to use with, with really high accuracy so within about 10 meters. Uh, then we, we also had elevation data with, with, the, with the tag, with, with the points collected. We could tell if they were really high up um, off the ground that uh, we assumed they were actively migrating. So 110 points um, we called, uh, the, you know, actively migrating or flying points. Um, we, we, we then, for the, for the habitats that they stopped at, we, we classified them as two different types of, of habitats. We did one called a quick stop, and that was just where we had one data point. Uh, so we don't really know how long it stayed there, except it, it was less than, um, six days anyways, uh, but because again, we we're only taking one point every three days, uh, you know, it could have been there a day, it could have been there three days, um, we wouldn't know. But we just called those quick stops. And if we had more than one data point at, at the same at the same location, we, we called them extended stays. Um, you can see pretty comparable, 187 quick stops, 176 extended stays. I think the longest we had a bird staying at a at a migration stopover spot was like 16 days. Um, and that's a minimum number. Uh, again, our, our, we were only taking points every every three days. Uh, this point was, a, was kind of an odd one I'll get at later, but you can see it's just a small forest patch um, in the middle of, a, of an agricultural um, landscape. That was a quick stop. <laughs> it didn't stay there very long and, and I'm not surprised. Um, it, it doesn't look like very good, you know, overall habitat. So in terms of the migration timing, we learned that for our Massachusetts birds, uh, they on average, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of variation around these points, but on average, they left in the middle of September. This is the map on the left. 
is um, a, a point here from the, from our Montague site. And this bird, and this is the pattern for pretty much all the birds. That the fall migration is the more easterly line. So the fall migration is this line, and he comes down and he winters here. And then this is the spring migration return um, pathway. So this was that point that he, that I just showed you in, in Illinois. That was that agricultural point. That was one of our farthest west points. I don't know if a if a weather pattern blew them off course, most of them are coming much, you'll, you'll see in some other in some other maps there. They're hugging the Appalachians much more. This, this guy got pushed to the west. Um, so on average, they arrived on their winter territory. They left in mid-September. They arrived in early November on, on their winter territory. Migration in the fall lasted approximately 47 days. Um, spring, spring migration, like a lot of species, was shorter. Um, so that they seem to be in a hurry to get back to those breeding grounds to, get, to return to their territory. Uh, they, they left the wintering grounds around the end of March, uh, but spent about a month or just over a month migrating and back on their breeding grounds by the end of April. We did have one, one of the joint base Cape Cod birds was back super early. Um, I think it was April 11th, it, it, it returned. And just checking eBird records, they were like, no whippoorwill sightings that early. <laughs> um, so it makes me wonder, you know, a lot of the, the nighthawks and, and their related hummingbirds, uh, you know, they, they'll enter during colder bouts, they'll enter into a state of torpor. And we think that's probably the case with, with the whippoorwill. We have no way of collecting data on that. Um, we didn't have any sensors uh, measuring temperature of the bird's body. Um, but, but this bird was on, it arrived April 11th, and I remember going out, we went out a bunch at the end of April, we never heard any birds. Um, and even at sites that we knew there were birds at after we got the tags, uh, that, that we think on those colder nights, they just, um, they, they, they're not active. And they, they probably go into a state of torpor to, to conserve energy. Um, but they can't get back early and in, in warmer springs, they probably are active. Um, but that spring, there were, there were some cold days. They got back April 11th, looking at the weather um, from the base. Um, there, there were some cold nights uh, that, that he had to contend with. Nonetheless, he survived, so. Um, let's see, spring migration was significantly shorter than fall migration. No, no real big surprise there. That, that's a typical pattern for, for migrant birds. They kind of take their time in the fall when they're not in such a hurry to, for nesting and, and they, they do um, make a, quick, a quicker spring migration pathway. Um, and as I was saying before, birds took more easterly routes for, for the fall and, and more interior routes uh, on their return flights. Although I'll say we don't have that much many data points for spring, spring migration. For a lot of our tags that we retrieved, the batteries expired um, either halfway through spring migration or, or even before it started. And we had a lot of, of uh, variability in just kind of the length of, of you know, distance wise and the length of time it took for fall migration. So our shortest one was a bird that wintered in South Carolina. As you can see this guy here, so he's going from Montague. We only had like two points, migration points. It looks like he made a straight line, um, but some of that is just lack of data. Um, but he wintered here, only took him 15 days to do it. Uh, and it could have taken them, yeah, that, that was kind of a minimal um, number. And our longest one went, uh, hugged the coast and then went around the Gulf. All of our birds, we didn't have any birds that we know of that went across the, the, the water, um, that, that went across the Gulf, even though hummingbirds are known to do it. Whippoorwills, not so inclined, it seems. Um, they all seem to come right around land-based, uh, a, a land-based route. Um, that their cousin, some the nighthawks, they blast right through um, either over the islands and onto South America or over the Gulf. Uh, but they're much, they have much longer wings, you know, given their morphology, you'd expect those longer migration routes or, or path flights for, for, for something like a common nighthawk compared to whippoorwills. Whippoorwills have a much shorter wing, um, so, so they're just not as, as uh, efficient flyers as something like a nighthawk. The pattern makes sense, given, given their biology, given their morphology. Um, but nonetheless, it was pretty interesting. We didn't have a single bird come across, come across the Gulf on, on either fall or spring migration. So anyways, the longest, so the longest migration was 95 days. So a huge difference between a 15 day 
uh, fall migration in, in a 95k fall migration. So here you can see a map on, on the left with all of our data points. Um, so this is all our birds combined from the from the from both years even. Um, so there are 332 points, and you can see more or less they're taking a pretty you know not not such a pretty similar route um, down the Appalachians. Uh, over and around the Gulf, but staying on that that east side of Mexico for the most part for for the migrate for the migration portion, and, and then down into Mexico or Central America. We, we built these heat maps in a GIS program, and this is one. This is just showing like the, the darker colors are, are where we had more birds um, spending time, and you can see you know up there in the northern or, or mid Atlantic areas. Uh, there's a lot of stopover happening here and also down here in, uh, in northern Mexico, on the, on the east coast of Mexico. Um, where, where there's more, they're just kind of flying over points between there, more or less. When we looked at, whoops. Hmm. Thought I had another map in there. Um, so when we look at that, that area in in Mexico, that, you know, this is limited data. Really, this was a uh, two or three birds that spent considerable amount of time um, right there in, in Mexico. Um, but it, but it does suggest that, that there could be a, a, a hot spot for a stopover area. You can see the habitat changes here when you look at the aerial uh, land land cover. It's much drier, uh, less forest habitat as you go to the north, and then you get. You know these dark green areas of forest. It, it's more of a drier forest here, not a tropical, um, not a tropical moist forest, but much more forest cover. So, you know, what jumps out to us is that this could be an important stopover area during migration for whipper wells. We certainly need more data uh, to, to, to get before we can say that with, with any kind of certainty. But, um, but that's what it leads us to believe. Here's a, an image of what that habitat looks like um, in northeastern Mexico. Here are a bunch of maps. So these are, each of these are eight of these. Um, one thing we did as part of this, this study um, that was new was we, we tagged birds over multiple years. So the same individuals over multiple years. Um, so we'd capture it. The first year we put a GPS tag on it. We capture it the second year. Uh, we take that tag off and lucky guy gets another tag just the same. So. <laughs> Um, but what we learned, we learned some pretty cool stuff. So these are the migration pathways. You can see a lot of them are pretty darn similar. So you can see or, uh, yellow dots and blue dots. And those are the two years uh, of data. And this bird almost, I mean, again, the data is limited. It's one point every three days. But nonetheless, you can see it follows almost the same path here. As it, as it migrates down out of Massachusetts through the southern United States and, and across Mexico. Some of them made some divergences, but overall that pattern's similar. Like this guy in one year popped down to the south and then over. Um, but this one's pretty similar. This one, here's a divergence here again. But you can see some of these are just remarkably close um, over the two years. They're not using the exact same stopover sites, it seems, but the overall pathway is really similar. So we thought that was that was, that was pretty cool information. Um, when we look at the spring, so we have a lot less data on, on our spring migration points. As I said, the, the battery started expiring. We, we had, particularly in one year, the first year of data, the batteries lasted a lot longer than the second year, unfortunately. Well, something with the batteries used in the second year of tags, um, they just they just didn't last as long. Some of them only lasted. Uh, for for twenty or so points before before the battery expired expired, um, so, so we had a that mostly took a toll on on the spring migration data that we got. So overall, we only had one hundred and forty eight uh, data points for for spring migration. You can see they're coming up out of Mexico, pretty much the same route. Um, it was a little bit more to the west than than the other one, than the fall migration, but coming up the Appalachians and, and into Massachusetts. Um, we had some interesting things at the very end, like one bird ended up in New Hampshire and then came back down into Massachusetts. He just kind of overshot the, the breeding area and then returned. 
one bird was up here and I think in the Adirondacks and came back down as well. So some, some cool stuff there. Um, you can see here is a similarly that kind of heat map where the, that some of these areas were, are, were, he, were heavily visited. Um, but once you get closer to Massachusetts, they didn't really stay long. Um, these were mostly flight. You know, they flew through this area pretty, pretty quickly. And landscapes were, were dramatically different at, at a lot of these points. We certainly had some migration stopover points that were just you know, heavily forested, which you think of as really good bird habitat. Um, so this is an Appalachian Mountain stopover point here um, on, a, on a steep hillside. But we also had like the one bird in Illinois, those agricultural areas um, or agricultural landscapes where they're just looking to find a little patch of forest where they can pull up for a couple of days and, and re-energize. And then this may be with our most interesting in, in some ways anyways, but this is the Newark, Air, Newark Airport right here. And you can see a little patch of forest right here on the river um, where this bird stopped over. So from urban to rural or agricultural to forest habitats, they kind of what you expect of a, of a migrating bird. They, they had to be plastic and use a variety of different different types of habitats um, during their migration. So for the migration habitat, um, we, we, we quantified it using land cover data in, in, in a computer program called, called uh, ArcMap, uh, GIS programming. Um, we use the North American Land Change Monitoring System map layer. This is, gives you an idea of, of this is, these are layers that are already created that show you green is forest and, and uh, orange is, is uh, agricultural and red is urban. Um, you can, you can uh, quickly quantify what the habitat is like around uh, the areas that the birds used. Um, so we, 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 we use this at three different scales, and we did the, the same with the migration points as with the wintering points. Um, so I'll just explain that here, but we did it at, at a kind of a fine scale, so only 500 meters around the point, and then you're quantifying how much forest is in that area, how much agriculture, agriculture is in the area, how much urban is in the area. And then uh, we took a bigger landscape approach too, and we looked at uh, kilometer circles, which is um, this one, and then uh, a five kilometer circle. So this is the five kilometer circle here. And then we also did, we repeated it with a random point um, to compare to what the birds are using, the habitat that the birds are using compared to a random point in that same landscape. So the land, random point was, was generated within this 30 kilometer buffer circle around the actual point. This is where the bird was. This is the habitat, the landscape level habitat it was using. And for this bird, this was its random location that was generated. Um, so we compared the, the actual points versus those random points. And what we found uh, was that forest cover seemed to be pretty important. Um, there was one and a half times more forest cover at the actual point. So in this graph, um, this is percent forest cover here, up to 60%. And on the x-axis, it's um, our different scale, so 500 meters, two kilometers, and five kilometers around the point. Blue is the actual, this is where the bird was, and the orange is this is the random point um, associated with the actual points. And you can see that at all the scales, whether it's the fine scale, or the bigger scales, there was more forest cover. Um, so that was interesting and, and pretty much what you would expect. You know, they're selecting areas that, that have more forest than, than um, areas that have more anthropogenic dominated habitats. And if you flip it around and you look at agriculture, um, so the same axes here, except this is agricultural cover, um, but the same, the fine scale to, to, the, to, the court, to the broader scale and the actual in blue, the uh, random points had a lot more agriculture at, at all the, the different scales. So they seem to be avoiding agriculture and, and selecting for forest habitat. Now moving on to the wintering grounds, this is kind of the, the point that sums up the study, or the, the, the image that sums up the study more than anything. These are all of our, our wintering territory locations. So each pin here represents a, a territory, and you can see most of them 
are, are in more than any place are in in this uh, south central central to southern Mexico, except not not in the Yucatan. They they avoided the Yucatan, um, and then down into Central America. So Belize, um, Honduras, Guatemala uh, had some, and then we had two up up further north. So so a big gap between our most northern wintering territory in Mexico, and then we had one just outside of Houston in Texas and then one in Southern South Carolina, um, which was just kind of bizarre to us. That's about as far north as their wintering range is. So, so the birds in Massachusetts, where a lot of species are showing this high um, migratory connectivity where, where populations of a species go to the same areas in the winter, um, what we found is our Massachusetts birds kind of go all over their wintering range, uh, we, which was a surprise. We, we thought that they'd be restricted to a certain a certain portion of the range that the Massachusetts birds would go one place and the Michigan birds would go another place um, in, in that overall range. But what we found is that our birds kind of span the, the whole range uh, on the wintering grounds. So a bit of a surprise there and, and different, that, that's a bit different than the, what most of the other species where this kind of data is available for show. Um, but, but most birds, so about 90% spend the winter in Mexico and Central America. So that's all of these points here. Um, we had high sight fidelity. So remember we, we uh, were tagging birds, you know, a bunch of the birds in multiple years. So not only were they returning to the, to the exact same breeding territories, but we found they were returning to the exact same wintering territories as well. So I know that's known for, for, for a lot of different species. Um, Mari and I documented it for cerulean warblers and, and some uh, uh, other species in, in South America as part of our graduate work. Um, but somehow it's always amazing to me when you document it for, for any species that they're going to the, the exact same trees and, and territory, you know, that are thousands of miles separating from their breeding to their wintering grounds. Even though, you know, at some level, maybe we can expect it at this point, it, it still amazes me. Um, that, 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 these, that all of these birds do that. Um, so all 10 of them, none of them um, showed any variation. They all 10 went to the exact same wintering territory. Um, you know, not, not even offset by 150 meters. It was just same, same spot, <laughs> which is pretty cool. Here you can see uh, some of the variation. It's like on the, on the someone on the, like on the migration points, on the variation on the habitat on the wintering grounds. This is the South Carolina point. Um, so he's got points over here on this little median or this little forest strip in, in some agriculture. And then also in, in the forest adjacent to the agriculture in this wetland here. This, uh, this is a little mark. Um, and, and then one in, in Mexico in Chiapas, which is much more you know, what I would have thought wintering grounds would look like. Um, but, a, but a patchwork of forest and, and maybe some agroforestry there too, but in the, in the hills and mountains of, of uh, Mexico. In terms of the, the home range size on the wintering grounds, pretty similar to what, uh, what we think it is on the breeding grounds. So pretty tight, they're not wandering, um, like some species have been found to, but that they have uh, on average uh, about two hectares. So a hectare is, is two and a half acres. So if you're more familiar with what an acre is, um, you know, it's a, this is under just about just about four and a half acres or, or so is their average wintering territory. Um, we had some outliers, so some of them were really big, like the South Carolina bird had a huge um, wintering territory, at least in one year. And so that made the averages bounce up a little bit. So some of them are really small too, but substantially we're just a couple of, we're just a couple of uh, acres. Um, the, the smallest at 0.34 hectares, uh, which is about one acre. Um, so, so a bit of a range there, but, but more or less, they're, they're similar in size to, to what the breeding territory is. Here you can see, so the same bird in, in two different years. To kind of hit home that message that they're going to the exact same places. Um, this is in, in the winter of 2019, and this is in the winter of 2020. But you can see this is, you know, this, this landscape's the same. There's that big lake, uh, the territories here, and, and the territory here is the exact same territory that he's on. 
And interestingly, the so this is one. This is the South Carolina bird um, that had had we had two years of data on, and the white the white uh, mapping here is is the second year of data, and the black mapping is the first year of data. Um, one pattern we found was that the, the birds that that wintered at higher latitudes, so farther north, had larger territories. It was it was that, that largely driven by two birds, though. So. We're a little bit limited in, in you know the patterns there, but but the, the inference in terms of the data is is limited because of the sample size being small. Um, but but this is like a fifty this is like a fifty acre area um, this first year uh, for the territory. Second year here, this was really tiny territory, you know, within that larger territory. Um, and it could have been driven by by weather patterns that year. You know, if it was really cold. Uh, the bird needed a larger area to, to forage on over um, to procure the, the, the insect resources that it needed. We're, we're, we're kind of speculating. Um, interesting pattern, um, but uh, but we're, we're kind of um, would like to, to to evaluate that further. We just don't have the data uh, as is to, 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 to do that. But there, there's some variation you can see. So you can see again the wintering, uh, some of the wintering areas, um, how different they can be, um, just like at the, with the migration point. So here's a bird wintering in, in just outside of the Jaguar Preserve in Belize, so heavily forested. Here's a bird wintering in an agriculture slash forest area in, in Mexico. And here's the Texas bird that's just outside of Houston, um, wintering in, in more or less an, an urban type landscape. So some interesting patterns there. We use the same um, general methods for, for evaluating habitat selection uh, on the wintering ground. Um, but, but initially we had to like hand digitize all of this, which if you don't know what that means is we, we had to take the aerial images that were available and classify them as forest or agriculture. And it's just really labor intensive. Fortunately, we had some students who, who did most of it. And then as we were getting ready to submit the paper for, uh, for publication, um, we, we learned of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, a layer that had been just recently available uh, that already had all that data uh, uh, um, completed uh, as, uh, as a download. Uh, so <laughs> that wasn't available when we started the study. Um, so we, we switched to using that much to, to, to our disappointment almost because we'd put so much time into it. But we use this Copernicus global layer, which kind of which covers the, the, uh, the, all of the Americas in, in terms of the, the, the habitat classification. So you can then look at your, you know, we use the same scales. Uh, we use the home range scale or a fine scale, a kilometer and a five kilometer scale. So we could look at the habitats in those three scales that the birds were using. And then again, at that random point, associated with the, with the used points. Um, pretty much the same methodology that, that I explained for the migration points, so I won't belabor it here. And what we found, uh, again, similarly, was that uh, they were using uh, more forest cover than, than, the, than the actual, um, than the random points. So here, uh, the, the actual points are the orange, and the random points are the blue, and forest cover is uh, here on the y-axis. Oh no, wait. Uh, no, the percentage of land is on the y-axis, and on the x-axis it's forest, agriculture, urban, and uh, shrubland. But you can see the actual points had sig significantly more forest in, compared to the random points. Um, the opposite for agriculture. The random points. So it's, it's the same pattern that we found in migration. So the birds are consistently showing that they're selecting areas with higher forest cover. So that, that was good to see. When we looked at that broader scale, that was at the, the fine scale right around the, the, the territory. When we brought it out to two kilometers, um, we saw the same pattern, not quite as dramatic as, that, that, as the prior graph. So this is the fine scale, the territory size, and this is the two kilometer. Um, but, but again, we see that it, it's their selecting areas that the landscape has more forest and less agriculture 
um, compared to those random points. The pattern started to disappear when we when we took the scale to five kilometers. I'm not showing you that here. This is just that two kilometer scale. And then one interesting strategy that, that we saw, and this was maybe the biggest surprise or, or one of the biggest surprises, um, was that we had four birds. And again, it's a low sample size, um, but we had four birds that in the middle of their, their, their winter period, their, their winter territory, they picked up and they moved. And they moved 32 to 73 kilometers, generally to the north. So, you know, almost like they're starting migration, but, but it was too early for that. Um, they settled down and they had a second territory um, before, and they stayed in that territory for six to eight weeks uh, before they, they actually started migration. And a couple of these birds, um, we were able to get tags on that, you know, for two different years. And incredibly, they did the exact same thing in both years. So they went to the same first territory and then they shifted it mid-season to the exact same second territory, something that we would never have thought of. Um, it, it was really quite incredible. Again, we're a little bit limited based on, based on the, just the number of birds that we had, just four, four birds, but, but uh, the pattern's there and it's unmistakable. Um, so interesting as to why, not sure why, why they did that. Uh, we, when we looked at the amount of forest cover, we, we classified the birds that stayed in one territory as sedentary and the birds that had that more mobile strategy as mobile birds. Um, when we looked at the forest cover, the ones that stayed had a higher forest cover. You know, that's, that's like 90% forest cover in their territory compared to uh, birds that moved had lower forest cover. So this is more like 65% forest cover. So that's one possible hypothesis is that they were in more marginal territories. Um, but that they did it in, in two, you know, the, the same exact thing in two different years was, was super interesting. We don't, we can't fully explain it, um, but it's a really, really cool pattern. Um, and, and it may be explained by the amount of forest cover at the territory level. So just to wrap it up, um, our, our major findings were that these birds that, that breed in Massachusetts, uh, had, had a pretty broad wintering range. So, so they range from South Carolina down to Honduras. Uh, they had high site fidelity on both the breeding and the wintering sites. They had high survival. So the after second year males, you know, we're, we're catching 85 to 95, 85 to 90% of them the second year. So they have really high survival rates. The younger birds that we had much lower recapture probability on, maybe they had somewhat lower survival, um, we think more than anything that pattern's driven by the second year's not the second year birds not having a, a full territory at the time that we caught them, but that they probably were more um, ranging over the the area, trying to procure a territory, but didn't quite have a territory yet. Um, we think these birds live a long time, and a second year bird may not breed initially. It may take until the third year that most of them nest. So, so we think a lot of the second year birds just weren't on territory to, to explain that, that reduction in, in the recapture of, of the second year birds. Um, so, but high survival for the adults anyways, for the after second year birds, um, low recapture rates for the second year birds, uh, selected heavily forested habitats, both during winter and migration, and when we, and, and over, you know, through the project, we spent a lot of time looking at those aerial images uh, down on the wintering grounds. And a lot of them came in different years. And I didn't talk about that here, but um, you could go back to, you know, 2010 or 2015 and look at the same areas. And what we noticed is there's a lot of, uh, of, of habitat loss and habitat fragmentation occurring on their wintering grounds. Um, we can't say for sure, but, but it certainly seems like you know, after looking at a lot of the, the imagery, that, that loss, habitat loss on the wintering grounds may be at least partially driving declines in, in this species. The next steps, as I, I, I alluded to this earlier, when, when I started the talk, um, we've wrapped up, we're no longer putting those GPS tags on birds. That, that portion of the study's wrapped up. So we're, we're switching gears and we're, we're, we're moving back to learning about the, the, the breeding grounds what the birds are doing here in Massachusetts. And we're trying to take a really fine scale approach at, at one site. This is gonna happen at Montague Plains 
uh, wildlife management area. And what we're going, what we have out there, um, or what we're putting up, is, is a network. These pins here represent um, a little uh, radio tracking receiving station. Um, they're called nodes, and they all talk to like one big receiving station. And we're gonna put these throughout uh, the wildlife management area and tag birds within. And the birds are gonna have typical radio tags, radio frequency tags. And when they um, send out a signal, they should get picked up by three or more of these little base stations, receiving stations. And that'll automatically kind of triangulate. Um, triangulate is kind of getting a fixed point. Um, so it's almost like it's not GPS data, but it's supposed to provide similar quality data in terms of precision to, to what a GPS tag would do, except we'll be able to get, hopefully we'll be able to get points throughout the entire breeding season, um, you know, every day, lots of points every day kind of deal. So we'll have uh, a lot of really fine scale data to look and see how the, the site is heavily managed. We manage that site with prescribed fire and with forest harvesting um, to benefit species like the whippoorwill. And, and we really want to know how effective that management is. And so this study is going to hopefully answer a lot of those questions in terms of, um, you know, what areas that the whippoorwills have the highest densities, what areas they're using, um, you know, how has the habitat management impacted them, uh, benefited them, um, and how it should inform our management strategies, not just at this site, but to other similar sites uh, across the state and, and the region as well. So really looking forward to it. It's a new technology um, that we haven't used before, uh, but we've got a grad student at, a, at UMass who's gonna be um, taking it on as his project as well. So we'll, we'll be eager to, to learn about it. That'll be happening this summer. Um, so hopefully I'll have an update on that in, in the coming years. Um, with that, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, some of our funding and partners. So we work closely with the staff at Joint Base Cape Cod uh, when we were working at that site. Um, we had some funding from the William Morton Trust and the Nuttall Ornithological Club, um, in addition to support from WPI and Mass Fish and Wildlife. And I am happy.